Today, I'm going to cover the various sound methods supported by DOSBox, along with how to configure them. This way, you can get the best sound quality possible out of your old DOS games. But before I begin, I'd just like to point out a couple of common mistakes you might make across the entire range of sound support in DOSBox. Firstly, there's a special section called Mixer in the DOSBox configuration file. The rate parameter specified here is the maximum sound frequency rate that will be audible, regardless of what you set any of the other sound rates to. For instance, if this is only set to 22050 and you set the Gravis ultrasound rate to 44100, you're still only going to hear 22050 sound. The maximum limit possible will depend on your operating system and the type of sound chip or card you actually have but 44100 is usually high enough, and higher than that and it becomes rather difficult to discern the difference. And secondly, whenever you're trying to get a game working, always keep in mind that auto detection routines in the game itself could be the culprit for problems. Turning various sound supports off or changing the modes they're operating in, even if the game doesn't support them, can go a long way towards solving non-audio problems such as crashes and lockups. Failing all that, just try to bypass any auto detection the game has itself and attempt to configure things manually. Now, let's get to the sound devices themselves. The PC speaker is an extraordinarily basic sound device. It's nothing more than a single square wave tone generator, where under normal circumstances you can only modulate the frequency of the square wave to produce various notes. However, using incredibly precise timing, it is possible to do rudimentary digital sound with the PC speaker, but few games do this because of the difficulty of getting the sound right, and the fact that it will almost always be loaded with distortion. Setting up the PC speaker in DOSBox is really simple, just set whether to emulate it or not and set the frequency rate you want. Higher frequency rates result in more accurate emulation of the sound, but requires more processing power. Old PC Junior and Tandy computers both have more advanced sound systems than a simple PC speaker, commonly referred to as the Tandy 3 voice sound system. Which, you have to admit, that's much simpler than the actual name of its sound hardware. The Texas Instruments SN76489 Digital Complex Sound Generator. Just rolls right off the tongue. This sound chip is capable of generating three square waves at once that can all be set to independent volume and frequency levels, as well as a white noise generator, which could be used for explosion sound effects or other things like that. Now, do those specs sound familiar? Well, you must own a Sega Master System because it uses roughly the exact same sound chip, just with some minor differences. Setting this up in DOSBox is kinda simple. Normally, DOSBox will only activate Tandy sound if you also set the machine type to Tandy. Now you can get around this by manually setting the Tandy mode to on, but keep in mind some games still won't support Tandy sound unless you're also playing in a Tandy graphics mode. Oh, and you can also set the frequency rate as well. Later Tandy systems actually had more advanced sound support referred to as the Tandy DAC, and is comparable in quality to early Sound Blaster cards. A few games utilize this, but DOSBox will support them nonetheless. You may need to turn off Sound Blaster support though for Tandy DAC support to sound its best. Since early computers had such lousy sound support, a company by the name of Kovox released an incredibly simple device you could plug into a computer's parallel port to actually get 8-bit mono digitized sound. This device was in fact so simple that many people opted to just build their own variant themselves. Even Disney came out with their own variant that sold for a mere $14. Well, even by today's standard, that's pretty cheap for a sound card. The DOSBox configuration file doesn't have a setting for the frequency rate because this is usually determined by the software being run. Instead, all you can do is enable or disable it.
Before Creative Labs debuted their Sound Blaster series of cards, they instead had a card called the Creative Music System, which used two Philips SAA 1099 sound chips to produce 12 channels of square wave tones and white noise. Essentially, you can think of this card as three Tandy 1000s and one PC Junior for good measure lined up together trying to produce a composition of some sort. This card was also marketed as the Game Blaster by Radio Shack, but it's pretty much the exact same card. Not many games support it because of how late it arrived on the scene and because it arrived at roughly the same time as the next sound card I'm covering, but for any game that does support the CMS, you can enable support for it in DOSBox by changing the SB type value to GB. Getting music into a DOS game was always tricky because of the lack of sound channels or the lack of memory to handle a fully digitized track. The AdLib card got around these limits thanks to the Yamaha YM3812 sound chip, also known as the OPL2, capable of mixing up to nine channels of highly customizable sine waves, or six channels while providing a set of specially modulated percussion sounds. The lack of white noise or the capacity to play back digitized effects gave the AdLib card a very distinctive feel compared to other sound devices, but also made it much better for music than for sound effects. In fact, a lot of games will use AdLib for music and still resort to the PC speaker for sound effects. Since the AdLib support in DOSBox primarily functions through the Sound Blaster support, you'll want to adjust the Sound Blaster settings to affect the quality of AdLib sound. I should also note that AdLib later made a card called the AdLib Gold, which is comparable in specs to Sound Blaster cards, but its high price point, among other things, made it virtually ignored by developers and gamers alike, so very few games support it. I don't even think DOSBox does. There are a plethora of Sound Blaster cards, all with various feature sets, but every single one of them has at least three basic functions. They can output fully digitized sound without distortion, they each had a port on them for plugging in joysticks, just in case your computer didn't have one, and they were all fully compatible with OPL2 generated music and sound, meaning anything you could play on an AdLib card would also play on one of these. And this is kind of why AdLib failed to get anywhere. Setting up a Sound Blaster card in DOSBox can be tricky, so it's usually best to just leave all of the settings at default, but some games will require very specific settings, in which case you'll have to set them here manually. If you do change these defaults, then make sure they don't conflict with the Gravis Ultrasound settings further down, or just disable Gust support completely. There's a few things to keep in mind with Sound Blaster cards as well. Firstly, the Sound Blaster Pro specifically does support a frequency of up to 44100, but only in mono mode. In stereo mode, it maxes out at 22050. So certain games that use the Sound Blaster Pro in stereo mode will see a small performance benefit if you set the mixer rate accordingly. Also, Sound Blaster 16 support is not yet perfected in DOSBox, and as such, some games will fail to detect or initialize it properly. In these cases, try to scale back to an earlier Sound Blaster card, or try altering all the configuration values until either something works or you exhaust your options. Lastly, every Sound Blaster card from the 2.0 onwards has support for OPL3 synthesized sound, but this is not quite fully backwards compatible with OPL2. For any game that specifically uses AdLib and not Sound Blaster sound, you may want to manually set the OPL mode to OPL2, but there's only going to be a tiny handful of games that will sound different this way. Five. 
all of the early Sound Blaster cards had one fatal performance bottleneck in that they couldn't actually mix digitized sound effects together at a hardware level, meaning the games themselves had to do this, which could easily cut into the performance of a high-end 3D game. The Gravis Ultrasound, also commonly referred to as the Gus, does this mixing itself, saving all that valuable processing power for gameplay. The only trouble with this approach was the Gus cards had limited amounts of memory to store the digitized sounds it would play back, so games utilizing the Gus would occasionally experience small delays as it shifted sound effects into and out of its internal memory. Setting up the Gus and DOS box is fairly simple, you just have to set its mixing rate and its various addresses, but if you intend to play back MIDI music using the Gus and DOS box, you also need to manually install some actual Gravis Ultrasound files into the directory indicated by the UltraDir parameter. MIDI is not really so much a sound standard as it is a method of transmitting musical data between different components, but MIDI generated music is infamous for never sounding the same between different systems and sound cards. Essentially, MIDI music will only sound right on the exact same kind of sound hardware it was originally developed for. A company by the name of Roland created several high-end audio cards specifically designed to work within MIDI standards, while still providing a means to have high-quality sound effects preloaded and played over MIDI as well. These included the Roland LAPC-1, also known as the MT-32, the Roland SCC-1 Sound Canvas card, and a slew of others. Until the adoption of the general MIDI standards, though, there was little consistency between MIDI-compliant cards, even within the same brand. Alas, MIDI support in DOSBox is very basic for a variety of reasons, the most blatant one being copyright, since the companies that made the ROMs and sound samples for these devices, such as Roland, still exist and still care about this sort of thing. Instead, what DOSBox does is route the MIDI commands through to your operating system, which will either play those sounds directly using the MIDI component of your actual audio hardware, or through additional emulation layers you have running in the background, such as MUNT, which is an MT32 sound emulator, but even that requires you to supply your own copies of the MT32 ROM data. There is one particular DOSBox setting to pay attention to in the MIDI section, the MPU-401 setting. Now, normally this is set to intelligent, but a handful of games may not work properly with this set this way, even if they don't have general MIDI support. In this case, changing the setting to UART or none will possibly solve these issues. There were other cards released in the DOS days as well, and I'm not going to mention all of them since there's virtually nothing out there that only works with such cards, though there are a couple worth noting. The IBM Music Feature Card was one of the earliest and one of the best for MIDI music, but was ridiculously expensive, so very few games supported it. There were also a series of cards released by MediaVision, dubbed the Pro Audio Spectrum. Now, these cards were somewhat similar to Sound Blaster cards and are actually compatible with them, so DOSBox doesn't emulate these cards because there's almost no reason to. Any game that supported the Pro Audio Spectrum directly usually supported Sound Blaster as well. It would take forever to cover all of these audio cards in detail, so I'm going to end things here. Stay tuned for episode 46 of Ancient DOS Games, where I'm going to be taking a look at an old 3D game that isn't actually rendered in 3D, but rather it's rendered using two 2D views, both an overhead and a side-scrolling view at the same time. If you know which game plays like that, then send your guests to ADG at Pixelships.com and stay tuned for next Saturday to see just how unique and difficult this game is.